Not one, not two, not three. Okay, yeah, actually it is three. Three GPUs. The 7900 GRE is launching. I've got the Azrock Steel Legend 7900 GRE. I've got the Sapphire Nitro Plus 7900 GRE. And I've got the Power Color Hellhound 7900 GRE. But the most interesting thing about this launch is that NVIDIA has already responded to it. Alright, so these GPUs have been out for a while, have been available in China, but this is the first time that they're deliberately coming to North America. And this is interesting. The 4070 Super just launched from NVIDIA at about a $600 price point. NVIDIA didn't really move the mark at all with their pricing. That seems weird, doesn't it? Like, NVIDIA is usually uh, charging a premium. I mean, pretty much universally, everyone was unhappy with the NVIDIA series, you know, the NVIDIA 4000 series launches because they were so expensive. But then about a year later, the 4070 Super launches for the same price. When have you ever known NVIDIA not to launch a card with a price increase? It's rare, if ever. This card is why. The 7900 GRE, 16 gigs of VRAM, better performance than a 7800 XT, basically the same price point as the 7800 XT. We'll get to that. And yeah, it's better performance than a 4070 non-super. Quite a bit better performance than a 4070 non-super, actually. I tested on a 14900K with tuned 6800 mega transfer DDR5 memory, two sticks, 96 gigs total, and I actually got much better performance than even AMD's own reference performance. It's unusual that that happens, but I was able to pull that off. This system is a 7800X3D, and I was able to get similar performance to 1080p, although I still was able to beat their press deck just a little bit with just a little bit of tuning and system configuration. Now, the performance of these three GPUs is really similar, but their physical form factors are, are all different. So hotspot performance and things like that will vary a bit, and the uh, Sapphire Nitro Plus 7900GRE is by far the most substantial. In fact, it is so substantial, it will not fit in our micro ATX case from Fractal here, at least not with an AIO in, whereas our ASRock Steel Legend graphics card will. ASRock also d differentiates themselves with some AI Quickset software, which I've taken a look at separately. We'll talk about all that. First, let's talk about performance, and then let's talk about the metagame of what's going on here. Let's start, as we always do, with the artificial benchmarks. For both Firestrike and Time Spy, the 7900 GRE is showing an impressive lead over the 7800 XT. The 7900 GRE is even able to beat the 4080 Tough Gaming from ASUS, which was unexpected. Of course, in Time Spy, that's not the case. The 4080 leads pretty significantly there, but the 7900 GRE generally pulls ahead. Let's take a closer look at Assassin's Creed Mirage. The 7900 GRE is within spitting distance of the 4080 Tough, but the 4080 Tough does pull ahead. The 4070 is left in the dust at 1080p, but notice what's happening at 1440p. This looks a little sus. 85 FPS, this is lower than it should be for the 4070. What's happening here is that the 12 gigs of VRAM is uh, biting us in the butt a little bit. If you turn down the textures, you can get better performance from the 4070 at 1440p, but I was kind of shocked that this is happening. Also, if you're a widescreen gamer, pay attention to this through these benchmarks. I really should probably set up a separate benchmarking pipeline just for 3440 by 1440 benchmarking because, and this depends on the game and the engine a little bit, 1440 can sometimes have a different texture profile. And because 3440 by 1440 has a different texture profile, the memory usage in 3440 by 1440 configuration can be a little different than just regular old 2560 by 1440. Because of that, there may be extra pressure on VRAM, depends on the game, uh, when we're talking about widescreen 1440p gaming versus 16 by 9 1440p gaming. You get that here with Assassin's Creed Mirage when we're talking about the performance fall off of the 4070 non-super. The other surprising thing about Assassin's Creed Mirage is because these are surprisingly playable frame rates for 4K. If you factor in upscaling technology or frame generation technology, yeah, you could game a 4K with this and have a reasonable experience. Now for Baldur's Gate 3, there's not a huge difference between the 4070 and the 7900 GRE, but there is a huge difference for the 4070 and the GRE when we're talking about 1440p. Now this, I don't know if it was down to texture memory or what. I didn't have time to dig into the specifics of Baldur's Gate. A little column A, a little column B, not real sure. I can tell you that the 4070 completely falls apart at 4K in Baldur's Gate, but these frame rates are pretty playable at 4K 
on the 7900 GRE. Shocking, I know. Borderlands 3 is an ancient title. That should run correctly at 4K, right? Nope. Well, it's playable on pretty much every card except the 4070. And while the much more expensive 4080 does pull ahead here, there really wasn't as much of a performance delta between the 7900 GRE and the 7800 XT as I might have expected. But still, Borderlands 3, it's an older title, so yeah, okay, that makes sense. Cyberpunk. Love testing Cyberpunk 2077 because of its unruly behavior and because its behavior changes over time. Like how it behaved last month and how it behaved today, completely different. Cyberpunk is one of those games that I probably would not enjoy at 4K, so I've omitted the 4K results for this, but for 1440p, this was a pretty delightful experience. At 1080p, you can expect almost 160 FPS. Now, if we detour for just a second and talk about Cyberpunk 2077 ray tracing, nah, I mean, really, do you want a, a $500 class card capable of ray tracing? The answer from NVIDIA is definitely no. The answer from AMD is mostly no. I mean, a little bit, sort of, kind of. The 4080 was the only card that offered a reasonable ray tracing experience here before we start talking about upscaling technology, which is kind of a big asterisk in that conversation. Like, I, it sounds like I'm dismissing it out of hand. I shouldn't be because, well, we'll talk about that. That's part of the Machiavellian strategy that's happening here. That's why you're watching this video, probably. You can just skip to that section. This doesn't matter. It's benchmarks. You can watch benchmarks anywhere. It doesn't matter. Horizon Zero Dawn, in my experience, all the way up through 4K, was a reasonable experience with the 7900 GRE. Very impressive performance at 1440p and 1080p obviously. And then our old standby, Shadow of the Tomb Raider, just to make sure we're not doing anything horribly wrong. The performance on Shadow of the Tomb Raider is very solid. Obviously, one, because it's an older game, but two, well, I mean, this gives you a baseline to figure out, you know, how the benchmarks and everything else stack up against everything else. This is the canned benchmark, too, I should say, in terms of, like, playing the game for about 20 minutes, like, actually playing it in kind of an intensive level. I had a better experience at 1440p. You can tell that the game and the GPU were definitely struggling at times in some of the more uh, intense areas of the game beyond 1440p, but the gaming experience at 1440p was very smooth. And there was a noticeable difference between the 4070 non-super and the 7900 GRE. I'm not sure I could really tell much of a difference between the GRE and the 7800 XT though. To be clear, all of these cards were within margin of error with one another when we're doing the benchmarking of the 7900 GRE. I'm going to take a separate look at these cards, don't worry, or if you're already on Patreon or Floatplane, be sure to check out our Linux coverage as well. If it's like, no, you must, you must tell me more. I must know more about individual cards. Because it's not just the cards themselves. I mean, like I say, temperature, hotspot, cooling solution, fans, noise, this kind of stuff. I mean, physically, you can see, like, the Steel Legend is the only card here that will fit in our micro ATX case. And yet, the temperatures don't really suffer for that. Just to give you an overview of that, temperature junction and hotspot. Surprisingly, our Hellhound, our power color, it was among the best. And our Sapphire card, which has the largest cooler of all of the cards, had the worst hotspot. So I'm thinking about taking it apart and seeing if it's got, you know, thermal issues, like a thermal paste issue or, or something isn't right. I mean, the card didn't throttle. It, it didn't even compromise its performance. It's just that... There's a GPU junction hotspot of 92 versus 82 on the Hellhound. Now, let's talk about the bigger picture here. A year ago, NVIDIA launched their 4070 series, and the 4070, or their 4000 series, and the 4070 was at that $600 price point. But then the 4070 super launched, and it's also $600. And now we got the 7900G or E from AMD that performs about 15% better on average than the 4070 in most games. What do you conclude with NVIDIA pushing the 4070 Super out the door? I mean, NVIDIA pretty universally was panned for the expense and even the naming conventions of their 4000 series GPUs. I mean, the 4070 Super was less unreasonable, but what changed from a year ago till today? AMD continuing to innovate and delivering the goods on their platform is what changed. AMD has been successful not only in eroding market share from NVIDIA, I think, but certainly at least you gotta concede that they've eroded mind share. I mean, look what they've been able to accomplish in the last year, certainly the last two, when you're talking about what AMD is able to do with their GPUs and their software and their whole stack. I mean, NVIDIA has taken notice and, uh, you know, yeah, NVIDIA still holds the lion's share of the market and their RTX cards are, you know, people are, or sort of coveting them, but NVIDIA's focus has always been on machine learning and the corporate computing side of it, not so much on the gaming side. And they charge a premium for their products across the board because they've sort of become the incumbent. And what AMD has built is incredibly impressive and no, it's, it's, it's not right to call it a viable alternative. AMD wants the gaming industry 
and they're pretty hungry for it, and they also want it to be standards-based. Speaking of machine learning, because these have 16 gigabytes of, of VRAM, they're, they're actually pretty usable, as long as you've got the software stack. That's Rock'em 6. AMD is updating Rock'em 6 to be able to support gaming tier GPUs, where they usually use cDNA instead of rDNA in the enterprise, but you can actually run stable diffusion and large language models and all sorts of other fun stuff with this. In fact, that's one of the differentiating factors of the ASRock Steel Legend. They've got the AI quick set to make it as noob friendly as possible. You can do it on all three of them, but ASRock has gone the extra mile to make it just point and click install for you, whether you're on Windows or Linux. And let's face it, if you're an NVIDIA buyer and you're buying from machine learning, you're probably buying a 4090 anyway. AMD, for their part, they've got a lot more support for machine learning than they did a year ago on this class of GPUs. RDNA is what I'm talking about. And the fact that it is basically a point and click installer, especially on Linux, you're gonna have a little bit more of a first class experience on Linux than you will on Windows. But be that as it may, the fact that you can get as much done with these, I mean, yeah, NVIDIA is still the incumbent here too, but if you look at what's going on, NVIDIA would much rather protect their machine learning market share than their gaming market share. Like all the margins are on the machine learning and the corporate side. And so that maybe leaves the gaming side ripe for disruption. The bottom line is the market will not tolerate a monoculture in this because of the insane profit margins, period. The more the profit margin, the faster we will see alternatives appear in the market because that's profit potential for somebody that's not NVIDIA. And with developers, when we're talking about developers on the gaming side, AMD's made enormous strides in their offerings with things like a GPU open. Fluid motion frames. We haven't even talked about fluid motion frames on these GPUs. This is a technology which helps with frame generation on high refresh displays. And this helps across a much wider uh, array of games than what NVIDIA's competing technologies is, are able to do. Uh, it's very difficult to benchmark that. You can, you have to experience it. You should try. Like go to somebody's house that has an AMD GPU and <laughs> give it a try. It's hard to benchmark in a meaningful way because it really, it really does mess with the frame rate as is reported by software. You got to use AMD's OCAT software and then that kind of thing. And listen, if you if you're at 30 FPS, you're never going to have an amazing gaming experience. But if you get like 60 or 90 FPS, you can get to like 120, 150, 200 FPS pretty easily. Baldur's Gate 3 specifically, 60 FPS, 4K out of the box. Okay, 70 almost. And with the upscaling and everything else, you can get over 100 FPS. And then you turn on fluid motion frames, and that's on the quality setting. Turn on fluid motion frames, 160 FPS, and that is a phenomenal gaming experience at 4K. And it's just a couple of clicks. Like AMD just wants you to hit the Hyper RX stuff in the GUI and get it done. And they've still got some work to do in terms of polish there, but it is really good. Starfield just rolled out support for FSR 3, and that is actually genuinely day one. It's probably not really day one, but it's launch day one. Shockingly good. Oh, another data point that NVIDIA has noticed AMD, GeForce Experience. You have to log in to use GeForce Experience. Who, who wants that? No one has wanted that, and literally every tech reviewer that I know has been like, why do we need to log into GeForce Experience? Well, I'll tell you why. It's because you need software to squeeze the optimal settings out of your game. GeForce Experience does that on the NVIDIA side. AMD software has gotten so good, I'm talking about Adrenaline, HyperRx, and all the features in there, about helping you optimize your games and getting the most performance out of them, that NVIDIA's noticed. It's an easier experience. You don't have to log in. It just works better. And so NVIDIA has said, crap, we need to fix this. And so they're revamping how they do GeForce experience. And guess what? You don't have to log in anymore. I mean, why do you need to know my email to make my game go faster? Why do you need to know who I am in order to give me the GeForce experience? It makes no logical sense. They don't need it. They shouldn't have it. And they're going to lose it anyway. It's dumb. So where does that leave us? So it leaves us with about a $500, $550 GPU. Uh, the, the market for five to $600 GPUs is really kind of oversaturated right now. I mean, I think that that means that we might see the 7800 XT come down a bit in price, or maybe the 7900 GRE will settle in somewhere else or something. I don't really know. In terms of raw performance, they're all really similar to one another. The 4070 Super is just a hair faster than the 7900 GRE in some games. Generally, the 7900 GRE is dramatically faster than the 4070 non-Super, and it's also a bit faster than the 7800 XT. So it really just comes down to, 
you know, CUDA is great for machine learning and that sort of thing, but you suffer under 12 gigs, so you'll probably have to spend more. Or the 7900 GRE having four more gigs of VRAM for the machine learning side of it. But four gigs of VRAM is also important for games. I mean, Diablo 4, Hogwarts, Jedi Survivor, all of those will use just over 12 gigs of VRAM at 1440p. And widescreen may be even more. So you factor in and all that. I mean, machine learning, to be clear, 24 gigs of VRAM and beyond is, would be nice for machine learning. I'm not so sure that that's not what AMD's thinking with the 7600 with 16 gigs of VRAM. Maybe we'll see something in the future. But for a 7000 series GPU with 16 gigs of VRAM for gaming, you're also pretty well covered in modern AAA titles. The next gen AAA titles, I mean, if we're already bumping up against the 12 gig limit, yeah. And ray tracing, <laughs> ray tracing is pretty weak sauce when you're talking about a five to $600 card, no matter which team you pick. Because of that, I don't really see ray tracing as a differentiator in these products. I mean, at the high end, maybe even with the 4080, and 4070 Super actually posted some impressive results for ray tracing as well. But really, probably the 4080 and beyond, okay, maybe ray tracing is a thing. Like, I'm really interested in that level of fidelity, but uh, at this price point, I don't think so. Another aspect is personal preference. Your personal preference counts for a lot here. I don't think that at this point in time, in 2024, anyone should be brand loyal. I really like what AMD is doing with GPU Open. I really like what they're doing with Linux. Be sure to check out our Linux video because we're going to cover these over on the Linux channel. Woo! AMD's recent offerings and all the stuff that they've been doing on the developer side of things. I mean, in my book, fierce competition can only be good for all gamers. I might like to see a little bit more aggressive pricing from AMD, if I'm being honest. But this isn't bad. I'll take it. In fact, it's quite good. I'm Wittles Level 1. I'm signing out. You can find me in the Level 1 forums. Woo! Good job, team! Uh, keep working on those drivers. You need to just, just convince them to keep hiring more programmers. Keep doing more innovative stuff with the drivers. All right, I'm signing out, and I'll see you later.